What a year. 2017 was an incredible time for gaming, with several high-profile game releases every month, over all 12 months. Combine that with a brand new home console from Nintendo, in March no less, and you've got yourself a year for the history books. No matter what system you own, there was something to be excited about on the horizon. So let's talk about my personal favorites of the year. I know, I know, I said I probably wouldn't do another one of these countdown videos after my initial one, but hot damn, this year was just too good to not feature on the channel in some capacity. A quick disclaimer, all of the games shown here I have played and completed, so sorry in advance to Nier Automata and Knack 2, which I never found the time to play. Also, it goes without saying that re-release ports aren't in the running. So sorry to Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, Fast RMX, Danganronpa 1 Plus 2 Reload, Kingdom Hearts 1.5 Plus 2.5 Remix, and pretty much every old indie release on the Nintendo Switch. <sighs> so without further ado, let's count down my top 5 favorite games of 2017. Well, this is a pretty unexpected start to the list. How many people honestly even remember this game from the first week of January? Well, more people should, because Future Tone is without a doubt the best Miku game to date, and honestly one of the best rhythm games I've had the pleasure of bopping my head to. Featuring hundreds of outfits and a staggering 220 plus song set list, each of these with their own unique music video, this beast runs the gamut of Miku and Pal's 10-year repertoire. Pretty much any genre you can think of is covered here from pop, jazz, rock, and... weird. With so many songs and artists, it's practically impossible to not find a handful of favorites among them. As far as the gameplay is concerned, it's the same gameplay found in the previous Project Diva games, pressing the four PlayStation face buttons in time with the music. New to this iteration are doubles, triples, and yes, even quadruple notes as well as slide notes, performed by pressing and or holding the left or right bumpers, and these are really fun to pull off. That being said, this game doesn't pull any punches when it comes to difficulty. Each song comes with four settings, and around half of the songs have an even harder extra extreme version to really wear down your controller. As a huge rhythm game fan myself, I can't recommend Feature Tone enough, if only on the strength and density of the setlist alone. Here's a perfect example of a gaming Cinderella story. This indie darling took the world by storm when it was revealed in 2014 with its instantly eye-catching art design, and three years later, here we are with the finished product. Was it worth the wait? Yes, yes, and all of the yes. Our story begins with Cuphead and his pal Mugman losing a bet with the devil and making a deal to collect the souls of the more rowdy inhabitants of Inkwell Island, and these guys aren't giving up without a fight. This game is a balls-to-the-wall, controller-to-the-floor shoot-'em-up where you and a friend can team up to take on boss fight after boss fight, with the occasional flying section and run-and-gun level. To be perfectly honest, the latter is probably the low point of the game, featuring some really frustrating mechanics such as the gravity reverse cards in Funhouse Frazzle, but thankfully the boss fights far outweigh these levels in quantity and quality. Every boss fight is unique, challenging, and downright Gorgeous. The amount of care and effort Studio MDHR put into every single frame of animation really shines through, and you can't help but smile, even after dying for the upteenth time. The progress meter that shows up after every death is a genius design choice, showing just how close you were to finishing them off, giving you that much more incentive to try again. Attention must also be given to the outstanding soundtrack, with nearly three hours of live jazz recordings that you'll be tapping your foot to in no time flat. An incredible achievement for their first game, Studio MDHR's Cuphead is one hell of a time. Damn, you know it's a crazy year when a brand new 3D Mario game only manages to make number 3 on this list. 
That's not to say this game is average though, quite the opposite. Odyssey is a return to form for the plumber, as it's the first time since Mario 64 and Sunshine that maps are fully explorable sandboxes, and <laughs> this game really rolls with that idea. Almost a little too much, as Odyssey features nearly four digits worth of collectible power moons spread across over a dozen kingdoms. It's a pretty daunting task when first starting out, but one that never got tiring for me. Mario is just as acrobatic as he was two decades ago, with a slew of new abilities thanks to his new companion, Cappy. With this magical hat, Mario is able to capture enemies throughout the game, whether that be series staples like Goombas and Bullet Bills, to new creatures like Moais, Plant Guys, and MANHOLE COVERS?! Every one of these controls completely different, and somehow all manage to be fun. Yes, even the manhole cover! This whole game is just fun, alright? Speaking of fun, another one of my favorite additions is the ability to mix and match Mario's hat and outfit with various costumes throughout each of the kingdoms. Some of them callbacks to previous games, and some of them just insane. You use two sets of coins to purchase these, and with lives being removed completely, it actually gives the best incentive I've ever had to grab coins. And with so many coins and moons to grab, it's easy to fall into a just one more mentality, especially in levels like New Donk City. What started out as a head-scratcher in the game's reveal trailer turned out to be my favorite kingdom in the game, featuring some pretty crazy side areas and, obviously, the Jump Up Superstar performance, an infectious big band number that'll be stuck in your head for weeks before and even after you've beaten the game. Dozens of hours of pure platforming goodness await on the Odyssey, and in the very first year of the Nintendo Switch's launch, too. Speaking of... What will go down in history as one of the greatest launch titles of all time, Breath of the Wild is without a single doubt in my mind the best open world I've had the pleasure of exploring. Like most people, when stepping out of the Shrine of Resurrection and looking over the hilltop at the ruined world of Hyrule before you, my first thought was, there's no way this game is that big. Slowly but surely though, those fears and hopes were realized. At the top of your first tower, I surveyed the land, and with the pin mechanic, marked down every single tower and shrine I could see. To my horror, some of these towers, when zoomed out on the map, were on the other side of the entire world. Always in view are these towers, Death Mountain looming over you, and of course, the corrupted Hyrule Castle, where Link's nemesis awaits. It's a jaw-dropping feat how big this world is, and yet how organic it all feels. It doesn't feel like some randomly generated hunk of rock. It's a meticulously designed, living, breathing place where every hilltop, village, and vista is simply incredible. Dotting Hyrule is over a hundred glowing shrines, each of them acting as a mini dungeon of sorts, as well as a fast travel point. These, as well as the towers you can see poking out of every region, are my favorite aspect of the game. You'll be gliding down from a high place, and just out of the corner of your eye, you'll see that familiar orange glow, and you'll be off track again. It's not always that, though. It could be a peaceful village built onto a hillside, or an enemy camp with some rare treasure. It could even just be a pair of rocks that looks out of place, but in this game, even that'll reward you. That's the whole point. This world is built to get lost in, and it succeeds wholeheartedly. That being said, it's not all roses for me. When it comes to the main Zelda staples, I can't help but feel this is one of the weakest games in the series. The main dungeons of the game, while interesting in concept, bored me with the same repetitive structure and aesthetics. The bosses don't fare much better with, again, each one looking indistinguishable from the other, and not a shred of challenge among any of them. Sadly, I feel the story is a missed opportunity as well. The main issue I take is that the story, for all intents and purposes, has already happened. It's hard for you to care about any of the champions, or even Zelda, when they've been gone for literally a hundred years and you're just here now to clean up the mess. It's a testament to just how good the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is that even with the main questline being a low point for me, it still manages to be one of the most unforgettable experiences I've ever had with a game. I will never forget climbing all the way up dueling peaks with an unupgraded stamina bar, 
or looking into the distance and catching a glimpse of what appeared to be a dragon rising from the forest, or investigating that eerie green glow on Satori Mountain and finding something I never expected. Breath of the Wild is, at its heart, simply breathtaking. Now, before we hit the number one spot, it's time for some honorable mentions! Danganronpa V3, Killing Harmony. Another killing game with another fantastic cast of memorable characters, featuring some of, if not my favorite moments in the whole series. Just prepare yourself for the absolute insanity that the finale brings, just like with each Danganronpa before it. The Evil Within 2. A solid sequel to the original that I wasn't really fond of, with gameplay improvements all around, a genuinely great story, and an endgame that is truly moving and satisfying. Sonic Mania. A fast blast from the past featuring gorgeous Genesis era graphics, level design that, for better or worse, is definitely a 2D Sonic game, and showing that Sonic fans can make a better game than Sonic Team themselves. Ouch. The end is nigh. Another nail-biting, stress-inducing precision platformer from the demented mind of Edmund McMillan. Masochistic but incredibly smart level design paired with the best controls I've ever used in a 2D platformer. No, really. Sumiko Garashi for Nintendo Switch. Just look at how cute this shit is! When I loaded up Persona 5 for the first time, all I could think of were my memories of playing Persona 4, a game that had already landed a spot on my top 10 favorite games of all time. A fantastic cast of characters, a memorable story, and a world that you feel attached to the entire way through. Could Atlas and P-Studio really capture that spark again? Well, considering this is in the number one spot, it's apparent that, yes, they somehow did it again. Not only is Persona 5 a better game than Persona 4, it's become one of my all-time favorites, and a game that I could not stop thinking about, even after the 95 hours I spent just to get to the credits roll. Hell, I've even had the same desktop and phone wallpaper since. Just loading up the title screen and hearing the music kick in, I knew I was in for something special. Immediately, the art style grabs your attention and is just gorgeous to look at. Everything just pops perfectly, and when you're flipping through menus over and over just to see how cool they look, you know they did something right. Adding to the visuals is the incredible soundtrack by Shoji Maguro, in what I feel is his crowning achievement. His self-described acid jazz runs throughout the entire game and fits perfectly with every second. It's magnificent. Persona 5 is a phenomenal JRPG through and through, boasting hundreds of hours of content spread across dungeon crawling and day-to-day -day Tokyo life. Diving into the former first, dungeons have been improved tenfold in this iteration. The randomly generated dungeons of the two previous Persona games have been relegated to one large dungeon called Mementos, a place mainly for side quests, whereas the main dungeons, now called Palaces, are full-blown Zelda-esque labyrinths, each with their own distinct locations and puzzles. The amount of workload must have been insane, with each one taking several hours to traverse, all fully designed and realized. This is also where battles take place, using your personas in fast, turn-based combat. Aside from some great new mechanics like Baton Pass, it's relatively unchanged from previous entries, but everything has been made much snappier and way more stylish, thanks again to the fantastic UI design. Hate to sound like a broken record, but the battle music is just spectacular, and never manages to get hold even hundreds of battles later. Moving on to the social aspect of the game, it's just as addictive as it's ever been. The entire game operates on a calendar, and you only have a set amount of things you can do before night falls. 
It is possible to do everything in a single playthrough if your eyes are glued to a guide, but that's not really the point. The point is to forge your own path, whether that means spending all of your time in palaces, hanging out with the various confidants, or eating at Big Bang Burger every single day of your playthrough. The game won't stop you. All that being said, the heart of Persona is, as always, the cast of characters you meet, and I don't think they've ever been better. That goes for the non-playable cast as well, and thanks to a smartly implemented reward system, Incentive has never been higher to see each of their stories unfold until the very end. It helps that the writing and voice acting is top-notch through and through. Persona 5 is a milestone achievement for the genre, and even after 100 hours was a world that I did not want to leave. So, can we get a Persona 5 Crimson announcement please? Just take my money! But until that fateful day, Persona 5 is my favorite game of 2017. Thanks for watching! I wanted to do something a little special this Christmas, so I hope you enjoyed the video. Sound off in the comments below about what your favorite games of 2017 were, and here's to hoping that 2018 is just as great as this year. Happy Holidays, and I'll see you next year. Bye!